it's on the YouTube channel. Um, some stuff from last year's multi-platform conference and some sessions with other speakers from the last year or two. So um, you'll be in illustrious company, Gaspar, I'm very pleased to say. Well, maybe it being five past, I'll, um, I'll kick proceedings off and um, we can see if anyone else joins us later on. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, first thing to say is uh, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Gaspar Pellison to the uh, Manchester Metropolitan Game Centre. Um, Gaspar is a lecturer in culture, media and creative industries at King's College London. Um, and its primary research interests are located at the intersection of queer and games studies. Um, Gaspar approaches games as a polysemous medium and a critical platform for societal reflections. Uh, he's particularly interested in alternative and deviant gaming experiences, some, some loaded quotation marks around deviant there, um, and practices, and has published in Game Studies, Continuum and Convergence, in which he's also part of the editorial board. Uh, and he published his first book, Manifestations of Queerness in Video Games, in July of this year. Um, and I have finally managed to track down a copy, which um, I'm very much enjoying. Uh, and I believe um, some of the research that you're presenting to us today made its way um, into the book. But um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing a bit more um, about it. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're ready, Gaspar, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Really excited for the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I will start sharing. Here we go. Everyone, I should see my screen now. And slide mode. And I'm going to swap the views. <laughs> uh, set it up. Here we go. Almost there. I do not have anything written in my present, presenter view, really, but it's just that yeah, it's much nicer this way. Here we go. Right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, honestly, this term has been mainly teaching and admin. So this was kind of a good way to motivate myself and actually do something research related. Um, although the week has been, the month really has been so busy. Uh, usually I like to kind of learn my, uh, my presentation by heart, but I'm going to mix mumbling and a little bit of reading. I have a few, a few uh, notes here and there. Uh, and it's probably for the best because you'll realize that I actually mumble and uh, digress a lot. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Gyaku Ryona, which is, I guess, a sub fetish genre on YouTube in which one opponent dominates another opponent. Um, but to contextualize the chapter very quickly, um, yes, it is part of uh, my book. And um, I have this here, perfect. Uh, Manifestations of Queerness in Video Games, which I've really been badly promoting. So here you go. Uh, and in which, as the title indicates, I talk about various manifestations of queerness in video games. So whether it is the queer reading of Kuja on the top left, uh, potentially gender fluid character in Final Fantasy IX, I actually focus on his role in the narrative and not his appearance at all. Uh, the reclaiming of Peony as a gay icon in Pokemon and the memes uh, that ensued. Um, Dragon Age Inquisition uh, character Dorian, who was supposed to be a poster boy for gay representation, who I actually read as queer, mostly thanks to uh, a, one romance and uh, fans uh, transformative works, queer practices such as queer flannery in uh, the path here that you can see in the bottom left and night in the woods and Gyaku Ryona, uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, today. So Gyaku Ryona, um, I thought I'd start with a few words about these videos, uh, which is a bit unusual, uh, just to set the mood really and uh, give you a bit of a, a fictionalized idea of how it could be uh, if it was uh, written, if the video was a written paragraph. So your opponent moves in your direction as the round starts. The fight is occurring in a remote place, a gothic ruin, an abandoned shrine, or even an underground car park. 
your choice. You remain immobile as the opponent grabs you, smothers you in a bear hug and throws you on the floor. Before you even have time to get back on your feet, they sadistically body slam you, crushing you with all their weight, leaving you breathless for a few seconds. You are still conscious, wondering whether making a move would be of any use. You accepted defeat as soon as the gong started, after all. They are much bigger and heavier than you. You might as well have forfeited before the fight, but what would have been the point? They straddle and pin you to the floor, trapping your heads between their thick as tree trunks thighs, sitting on your chest as you struggle to breathe again. You can see beads of sweat trickling down their belly and the crotch that faces you. Dominant, their flex, their biceps, grinning. The round is far from over. So this is not a terrible fan fiction that I've just written, uh, although it could be. It's very much uh, an introduction to what you're going to see now, because before giving you a proper definition of what Gakur Yona is, I thought I might as well just show you a few videos. Uh, it's exactly how I encountered them, actually, by accident, although you might understand that I might have some affinities towards some of the things that happen in these videos. But it was really accidental, and it's kind of why I kind of decided to write about it. So here's the first video. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. Do not worry. Um, and yeah, it's starting now. It doesn't matter if you don't hear the sound too much. Right, so this goes on for eight minutes, just so that you, you understand the dynamic of this, uh, of this video. Uh, just because, you know, we, we're, all, we, we're all here in a safe place to, to have fun. I was going to show you another one. There are three of them, but I think I might not, you know, show you the three of them. Uh, you will guess that they're actually relatively similar. This is taken from Dead or Alive 6 and not Tekken, except from that. Um, you, can, you will notice a few differences, but Right, I'm going to stop now. As you can see, three minutes and a half, you know, um, it's obviously five rounds for Bass, unsurprisingly, and only uh, zero for Rig. Uh, so I think you get the dynamic here and where the narrative is going. So what the hell have you just watched? Uh, well, this is a Gyakuryona video, um, and uh, now I can give you a bit of a, a few definitions I've really gathered on the net. Uh, because I have no academic definition for it, at least not yet. I guess I gave one in my book, but I'm not sure I'm really the authority on the, on the matter. So it comes from Ryona first, which is a portmanteau of the Japanese words Ryoki, seeking the bizarre, and Onani, which is masturbation. I think you might understand where that comes from while watching the video, potentially. 
It depicts a character being physically hurt in a sensual way, debatable, or in a sexual situation, again, relatively debatable. Typically, the actual genre of Riona, so not what I've just shown you, is a woman which is being, who is being hurt in a way that wouldn't immediately draw blood, cause lasting uh, impact, uh, physical harm or death. That's uh, defined by Sanwa, who basically collected a lot of um, internet fetish uh, on, Japanese, on the Japanese internet. Although there can be exceptions, especially when it's taken from a video game, for instance, Resident Evil, when actually there is gore and blood. It's worth noting that Riona is a voyeuristic fantasy fetish, and most people from the community, if we can call it a community, differentiate itself, of course, from sexual sadism or rape fantasy. I am not looking at Riona uh, for many different reasons, actually, in this talk. As you might have guessed, I'm looking at Gyaku Riona, which means reversed Riona. And by watching the video, I think you might have guessed where it goes. Basically, the oppressor is not necessarily uh, male or masculine presenting, but the victim is always going to be, again, masculine presenting. So Gyakuriona operates on, um, I'd say, several platform um, on YouTube, as in it stems from cartoons, anime, video games, uh, machinimas, and so on and so on, drawings. But YouTube is very much the most uh, prevalent platform, and video games uh, are yeah, the medium the most used for Gyakuriona videos. Uh, because uh, of the fact that I'm looking at Gyakuriona male on male, as in men, men, which is an appellation that you can find on YouTube, I'm going to refer it to Grimm just because it's quicker uh, and will <laughs> save me a few seconds. Um, I am looking, uh, I mean, I'm starting the methodology here really, but I'm looking, I have looked really in this chapter at the most popular channels, which were Gyakuriona male, defeated men and guys in trouble. Uh, Gyakuriona male is the channels I've just shown you. Defeated men had a lot of camera mods, so there were a lot of modifications in terms of angle. And Guys in Trouble uh, had a lot of outfits, uh, outfits changes, and especially outfits that didn't exist in the original games. Now, what you're seeing on the right, just to add to the confusion, because let's be honest, this chapter is definitely my most chaotic, which is also, also why I'm presenting it, because I think it is still a work in progress. Uh, what you're seeing on the right uh, are, could be called Mugen Riona. Mugen is a software that enables you to create and edit 2D fighting games, and there are plenty of character models. And as you can see, Mugen Riona is a lot more explicit. Characters are being abused, of course, sometimes by penis blobs or weird shapes, and, um, and you can see body fluids. Still, these were less popular at the time of writing. I'm not that sure today. Uh, I don't think my arguments are that far. I think some of my arguments will apply to them. Maybe not all of them. Uh, I don't think they're completely basically excluded from uh, this presentation. But as I said before, I'm just going to concentrate on the videos I just showed you. Regarding the audience, there is a strong reason to believe that there is quite a diversity of viewers. Um, Unfortunately, with YouTube, it's quite anonymous. There are literally no portraits whatsoever in most uh, Riona videos. But from the comments uh, to people watching for the lols to other requesting to see a character being abused in a certain way, others really sharing their desire or pleasure of watching these videos, and others definitely more uh, reminiscent of kind of like boy love kind of narrative and you can see also on that profile they're very much into for instance ya yaoi mangas and so on and so forth there is isn't to believe that there are women watching this and uh that the people watching this are not necessarily gay straight or queer uh, there's a bit of everything um so it's doesn't really impact my arguments i think but it's just good to know um, next slide, I think, is the, my main hypothesis for this chapter, which is that Grimm is a controversial and violent genre, um, which kind of um, paradoxically uh, lacks drama and actually becomes quite boring quite quickly. I didn't want to make you watch the eight minutes, but maybe I should just to you know, <laughs> make you feel, make you properly experience you know, the video. 
I do believe, however, that it really goes beyond the hypermasculine reenactment of the punishment of weak masculinity. I believe that Grimm is a polysemic text. It's an example of queer effervescence. It also twists the core principles of fighting game culture and kind of queer erotica as well and reclaim as a consequence to your game as a kinky medium. So let's start with queer fragility and effervescence. Um, first, the space. I don't know where I'm going. Oh, no, yeah, of course, the method. Um, I've been looking at 200 videos for this chapter. Uh, I'll just skip that quite quickly. Um, but the most important thing is that I am looking at the, the video's content. Uh, and it's a bit disappointing. I know for a game scholar, uh, for a game uh, studies presentation, I'm actually not really going to talk about the playing of these videos. Although it is worth mentioning that these videos are quite easy to perform. Um, they only require the computer or the players to remain passive, and anyone who's played a fighting game probably knows that it is often in practice mode, or even in settings, it's often possible to just disable the computer AI. Hence, or as a player, you do nothing and let your character be beaten up by uh, a computer AI, or basically you disable the computer AI and which leaves the opponent at your mercy. So it is all that is left after this is just to upload the recorded video on uh, YouTube. So for this reason, I am mostly looking at the content also because Grimm is primarily designed for viewers being on YouTube. But again, I do think a few of my arguments kind of apply to the playing of Grimm, but I'm not going to inquire really the actual libidinal motivation of each player, basically. That's another, another step. It's probably another, some ways, another chapter, really. So Giacolino is a, an effervescent community, for sure, uh, to say the least, and very fragile as well. It's fragmented, it's anonymous. There are no academic definitions. What I've, what I've given you a definition taken from Reddit, Urban Dictionary, or people from the community really trying to agree. And it's also on YouTube. Anyone who worked on YouTube probably know that it can be quite chaotic and a nightmare to analyze when it comes to comments. YouTube as a platform really offers limited interactions. The layout is chaotic. It's often short-lived, even the comments stay. And yet it's quite resilient. I mean, you know, we, everyone is announcing the death of Twitter for now, and YouTube will probably survive Twitter, for instance. Uh, YouTube is also a lot more eclectic in its appeal. Uh, there are, all generations are on YouTube, really, and consuming YouTube. So in many ways, YouTube is that kind of solid cyberspace, hostile, fragile connections. Unfortunately, channels, especially when it comes to Gekuriona channels, are kind of expected to shut down. The three channels I've used in this chapter shut down two months before my book got published. And it was a bit upsetting because I put a lot of links and a lot of references to the videos that I described. And I was a bit surprised because one of, one of the appeal of these videos as well is what they were completely bypassing censorship. There was no PG-18 or you didn't need to sign up, you could just watch them. They were just Tekken videos, right? So with kind of lost, lostful comments, but still, in the, in the comment section, but still, and uh, for this reason, I think some of the videos probably gained enough momentum to probably alert some moderator, maybe the algorithm picked it up, and most of the channels actually got shut down. Uh, but new ones are being created as I speak, and Gekuriona Mail, which was the most famous, has another one now, which is at the moment still a little bit more dormant, uh, but the, per the admin is uploading um, videos probably once a week. When it comes to fragility as well, it's the, the connection, the connection, there is no, when I said community with inverted commas, it's because I, I haven't really encountered a community and I've tried to contact people and failed for three years. Uh, so I've tried to contact admin and never got an answer. It turns out that Giacriona Mail, that you can see here, is actually at least francophone. Uh, he's playing French games, located in Paris on his YouTube account. So I thought it would be a way for me to contact him. It didn't work out. Uh, so uh, these are just screenshots of conversations that happen uh, below uh, popular videos. I like this. What happened to your old channel? Deleted by YouTube, you know, no comments, nothing else. These are two admins, by the way, guys in trouble. 
And so they actually, they know each other. Um, and then I think the other one, which I don't think I can, I don't know if I can move uh, everyone's camera here. Yeah, I can, beautiful. Um, you can see a literary request. Can you re-upload or remake the Kuryohu to, to Tanaka Ichiro Yona? I mean, that video is the best of you video. I'd love to see that again. Of course, it's a reference to the old channel. No answer. Does anyone want to be my punching bag? No answer. You know, that's like, I love, I want to be choked, blah, 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 blah. Actually, that reply is him again, uh, them again, um, adding a comment. Do you have Street Fighter V? Yes, I have Street Fighter V. <laughs> and then no answer. So what I'm saying is like, these are the conversations that happens on most of the videos. Some admins are better than others. But again, let's just say that th this is just really representative of what I've encountered. In general, conversations are kept short. There's no real exchange. We're very far away from bigger online subcultures, basically. Uh, this also um, might be because, despite the fact that it's very popular on YouTube, it is multi-platform. Again, I'm sorry, I don't know why I thought that changing the place of my text was a good idea, but... Um, so Patreon um, kind of got on the Gekuriona train in the sense that a lot of admins started using Patreon, and it kind of became the only way to upload new um, YouTube videos. The problem with Patreon is um, that um, it wasn't really popular. I think there, I think the culture subculture, this genre is too niche really to attract people. And uh, I think the Gyakuyona male Patreon probably totalized maybe 10 or 15 purchases, which is nothing in comparison to the 40k views that he would be getting uh, from um, his uh, yeah, most popular video. Uh, it's also kind of ironic to see that such, such a niche genre on YouTube managed to be monetized. And in some ways, it's kind of like kind of creeping neoliberalism coming into all forms and sorts of forms, even in this kind of like, I would consider quite a dark corner of YouTube. And um, it's quite interesting to see that basically Grimm promotes intimate desire and, and fetishes in a way that is really public because people can just share the enjoyment of this without enabling any kind of strong ties to form. So we're very far from obviously much bigger groups. If you think about, I don't know, BDSM leather groups, you know, gathering around aesthetics and actually talking about it and probably because much less people are into this. Um, but again, it's interesting to see that Gyakuryona is basically a fragile ensemble of disjointed channels on Patreons. Some fan arts get a lot of views, but that's kind of it. Um, and the crowd is very, very heterogeneous. The content, though, I think is quite fragile as well, or at best is a good illustration of Ahmed's theory. Uh, so here we're going back to a bit of theory. Uh, so I'm just going to stop mumbling. As you might know, in the pursuit of unhappiness, Sarah Ahmed's rise that queerness is imbued with fatalism as we learn making from breaking. The perception of queerness as self-shattering is deeply ingrained in the mindset of queer individuals. Queer endeavors are expected to fail and lead to misery, loss and suffering, which in turn fulfills the morbid assumption that they are the only logical outcomes of a queer life. So this argument originates it's in Sarah Ahmed's pursuit of unhappiness, another queer feeling that resists the concealing of inequalities and oppression of marginalized individuals through happiness. So Sarah Ahmed advocates for the nurturing of bad feelings, from negativity. Obviously, along the same lines, uh, you can think of Jack Halberstam, Queer Art of Failure, and uh, Bo Ruberg's No Fun Games, which I'll talk a bit later. Um, but unhappiness become basically the only way to escape the heteronorm, according to Sarah Ahmed. It's a tool of political freedom, it's a cultivation of negative feelings and practices. And I think that we can actually argue that the narratives, at least, that are showcased in green videos may be a bit of a stretched, but really embody queer fragility on several layers. The most obvious being the unstable bodies it choreographs on screen. The fighters' bodies are often excessive, beautiful, unreliable, fake, deceitful, and disappointing. They cannot deviate from the pre-coded moves that they have initially been given, and yet still manage to execute them in a hypnotic and unsettling manner. 
It shouldn't be this easy to perform holds on an opponent in a fighting game. The latter shouldn't spend so much time crashing on the floor. Viewers shouldn't comment on the fact that a character's body is, I quote, from a Guys in Trouble video of 2016, so shiny and hot and looks good knocked out. In this alarming dance of damage, Grimm knocks out conformist desires and impulses and promotes bad feelings. So in that way, the muscle characters give a performance that is both rigid and clumsy, showcasing bodies that are both unbreakable and worthless, puzzling mainstream gamers, and yet clearly arousing others. I just want to show you this other video, which is a bit different as what I was, what I was mentioning before, the camera mod. And as you can see, it's actually same principle, but very much different effects. And uh, I think this very much illustrates um, my point about uh, Sahamid's uh, queer fragility. So here you have a camera mod of Jin from Tekken being left on the floor and another character teasing him repeatedly. So this has obviously been again edited heavily. Then Jin is being kicked soon. by another character. So you can see just the like kind of like rugless doll kind of body. Then Jin is being like held in the air thanks to psychokinetic powers from another opponent. Then uh, Jin is being, I don't know, yeah, sliced by a, by a samurai. Then Jin is being held by another character in the air. So you can see this is very much that what I'm kind of getting here, this idea of kind of like almost the performance of body fragility and um, that cultivation of oppression of the body um, that we can really think into when it comes to the aesthetics of uh, these videos. Of course, this is really alarming for mainstream gamers and it leads me to my second point, this quiffervescence fragility and especially this unhappiness being cultivated in these videos fails, obviously, fighting game culture. It's probably the most obvious point here is that for anyone who's remotely interested or knowledgeable about fighting games, uh, Gyakuryona is uh, at the opposite of the spectrum. So the, Todd Harper uh, writes a very interesting, uh, very easy to read um, book, wrote a very easy, book uh, to read about fighting games, uh, fighting game culture, and really identify three core practices. Play practice, which is uh, refers to how games are actually played, a quote, end quote. In fighting games, a player is expected to be skilled and competitive, be it, I quote, against a computer or against another person, end quote. In tournaments, skills are displayed through the use of special moves, attacks, defensive acts. We're trying to kind of prevent and preempt someone, someone else's attacks, trying to read the other character. Basically, any display of skills, any reading will receive, I quote, accolades, accolades and cheering from the crowd, end quote, which above all rewards players for their alertness. Normative play, it refers to how players feel games should be played. So basically the social context, the norms, cultural, contextual factors that guide thinking about how the ideal experience ought to be. And social play is about how players play together. It incorporates aspects of both practice, play practice, and normative play. All of this, all that ensemble, of course, um, as a consequence, um, creates actually quite a lot of drama when it comes to fighting game culture. Basically, fighting game culture loves drama. And what I mean drama, it means that players need to be highly skilled and the resolution unpredictable. In Harper's words, again, the more technical the play, the more fantastic the footwork, and the more close the shave, the greater the crown sense of drama and enjoyment. I'm going to show you one last video, and then no more videos, but this was a final of um, big second tournament. I can't remember with Q Dance and uh, I think uh, Ni. I don't think it was Ni actually. And Q Dance was basically returning from five years of absence. He was a champion more than five years ago, uh, so in yeah, 2012, and he came back, and he came back with a bang. So he, you go, you can see how people actually react to that kind of like 
dramatic fight. If you can hear the comments, if you cannot, that's okay. But basically they're talking about calling an ambulance and you know they cannot cope with what's happening on the screen. On the scoreboard showing signs of life here. And I mean, this is a guy that we really thought was gonna have this Yeah, and now he's down a game here after the bracket reset. Gonna start seeing sidesteps left. Okay. Oh, that was so smart not to continue. Sometimes the second hit won't reach. So aware. Oh, oh my gosh, this is so dangerous. Both of these guys going at each other's throats. Oh my gosh, oh, the I don't know if you can hear the screams, but I can definitely hear them in my office. So. Unbelievable. Oh my gosh, there are no words to describe this. Anybody's match here? Oh, the goddess are coming out. 13 seconds on the clock. Fishing oh. for that downpour, too. No time. What's he gonna do? And you, you can think he's gonna have to go low. There's no time left. Oh, snap! Oh. Right, you get the gist. I love it because for me, it's like. I'm sorry, and no offense for those who love fighting game competitions, but it's really like straight people watching, I don't know, drag race, but fighting games instead. I, lo I love it. So basically screams, this is a dramatic fight. It ends one second before the, you know, the, the last, the, the countdown, whatever you, you call it. It, it. This is the epitome of a dramatic fight. Now, I don't think I need to explain myself too much after the, the Gyakuryana videos that you've seen uh, to tell you how Gyakuryana really fails any of this. Like, there is no drama in Gyakuryana fights. You kind of know the winner after 10 seconds. You know who's going to be the oppressor. You know who's going to be the victim. Um, in, I think the most important thing as well is that the loss or the win in Gyakuryana is, of course, worthless. It is hollow because the other character, the victim, just let themselves being beaten up. Or it is kind of weirdly humiliating because desired as a loss. And again, doesn't display any sort of skill, doesn't display any sort of reading. More importantly, displays a type of play practice that really goes against mainstream play practice. Same with normative play. And when it comes to social play, you shouldn't comment on the hotness of Jean's body, for instance. And I'll talk about it a bit later when it comes to con contact sports. So again, Gyakuryona really goes against the grain in that way and really fails fighting game culture. As you might have guessed, of course, um, it fails fighting game culture as well because it just focuses on failure. But here I want to focus on queer failure. So if you just want to talk about failure, you have Jules' definition, which basically say that failure is just a consequence um, of uh, gaining pleasure. Jules argues that players like to fail, not too much, and um, basically, argue, basically explains to us why uh, roguelikes are very popular today, for instance. If you think about Dark Souls and Demon Souls, the whole point is to die and retry and to get a bit better after each death or to accumulate a little bit more. So again, failure actually doesn't, it's not necessarily negative as long as it kind of leads somewhere. And this is where kind of Ruberg pitches in, um, especially inspiring themselves from Jack Halberstam. Ruberg argued that queer failure in games is um, non-desirable because she argues that fun, mainstream fun, is cultural, structural, gendered, and especially oppressive by writing about Gamergate and the oppression, of course, of mostly female journalists, but also gamers who enjoy plays which are not fun, such as gaming simulators. Ruberg argue that actually we should play game for the wrong reasons then, if we want to be queer. So we should play to be hurt, play to be aroused, play to fail. And I do believe that failure is very much the essence of a green fight, whether it is about failing the game you're playing, failing the culture around this game, but also even just about the aesthetics and the bodies that you actually showcase. Again, debatable, I'm very happy to talk about it a bit later. Um, I'm going to keep on going because I'm aware that time is ticking. This is the last kind of 
not heavy theoretical, but I've definitely been shooting too many arrows in this chapter. And I basically um, want to quickly unpack how failure happens. I think it's pretty, much, pretty obvious for everyone, as I've just said, it can be just disabling of a computer AI or just two players playing at each other with an agreed role. Again, quite similar in that way to BDSM again. But I kind of want to mention queer active passivity here because I very much think that it applies. Bohuniki and Milligan explore, explore queer passivity through the subversive concept of another concept that I'm actually not really talking about, lexigraphing. So lexigraphing comes from the lexigraph, which was coined by Garrett Stewart in 2007, which in this description of paintings of written text, basically lexigraphs, I quote, do the graphic work of wording. Okay, so coming from this, Bolukhaniki and Milligan basically starts by saying that players are often put in a rightly relationship with the game's text by playing, they kind of modify, although they don't really, they don't mod it, but modify the, the game's code. If they read, it is more of a passive action and the game's narrative is not necessarily modified. That's the beginning of their kind of theory. But they start looking at, gay, at walking simulators, which are kind of, again, a bit of an anomaly on the um, video game landscape. And they argue that walking simulator involves a collage of reading material, which limits greatly the player's action. They argue that walking simulators cannot be encapsulated by the understanding of play as writing or reading as passive. They read lexigraphing as a hybrid and queer strategy of play in walking simulators that allow for reflection upon in-game actions and their reading writing ability. So starting with that binary premise, they basically argue, they present walking simulators as interactive experiences which promote active passivity, understood as a state of performing acts, I quote, commonly considered to be passive or paradoxically inactive, end quote. I argue that it's quite a convenient definition as in it's a bit of a one, you know, one size fits all, but walking in games positions the player as a collector, a conduit rather than an author. It is both paradoxical and contra contradictory as it is doing that rejects gaming as an allegory of our world as a space for action and production. And this, it kind of rejoins other theory, so it's something that I really like, such as queer flannery, queer meandering in games, and basically, um, Kind of like useless playing and uh, gaming that is not leading to the accumulation of capital wealth or skills well grim isn't really a um, walking simulator right but i do believe that the victim stays mostly immobile while the torturer repeats its identical moves in a kind of willful way it's been plan has been actively planned the pre-coded cyber text is read and played but it's never really fulfilled the variety of narratives are overlooked. If we're talking about drama again, who's gonna win this? The result remains the same. Just like walking in games, Grimm kind of queers, kind of walk, passively showcase something in a game space by almost entirely dismissing it. So Grimm challenges the purpose of fighting games, which have been primarily designed to provide dramatic and tense moments. It offers a platform for a gameplay that shouldn't be. The mechanics are turned upside down, the fight is rendered pointless for any common viewers, and yet the videos last for a minimum of five long or three long minutes, as the last one I showed. Gre queers the arena by deconstructing his defining features and reassembling basically them in an uncanny manner. And now it leads me to my last kind of section, which I think is very much the elephant in the room, is about the erotics of Grimm. Of course, Grimm fails fighting game culture by being, by bringing erotics to the foreground, by really much kind of acknowledging them. Although, as I'm also going to say, it kind of queers the erotics as well. Because let's be honest, I'm not really sure many of you have found this video really appealing maybe you have and please tell me if you do but I actually haven't really the first time I was more kind of puzzled and interested yet the narratives that are showcased in Grimm videos are very much reminiscent of pro wrestling especially the squash match so I don't know if some of you are very familiar with pro wrestling I actually wasn't that much until maybe five years ago but the squash match is a narrated, of course, matches pro wrestling in which 
the big heel, often mostly dominant, is going to dominate, humiliate, uh, submit the poor, kind of preppy, more lean, slender jobber. And uh, the heel may dominate and submit again that jobber over and over again, depending basically no holds barrel in terms of aesthetics, everything is allowed, and it very much pro promotes that idealized version of gritty, dangerous masculinity. masculinity. Basically, the, the strongest character in pro wrestling can do whatever they want. And it's quite interesting because Pronger and Woods actually argue that pro wrestling, pro wrestlers have become bigger and bigger with the years. We again, emphasize the kind of idea that hypermasculinity is very much on the rise. Now, UFC is not about one-sided fact, a uh, fight, or shouldn't be. The point about UFC, when I say UFC, MMA, mixed martial arts, sorry, mixed martial arts thoughts, but thoughts, <laughs> fights are very close uh, to, um, to fighting games, competitions, really. Um, the, the audience wants drama. And yet they're also, especially in the mise-en-scene and spectacle, really much promote hegemonic masculinity. You can think of Conor McGregor and Habib Nurmagomedov. I think a uh, fight two years ago, which was a big fight, which actually ended up with some of the staff, I think of Habib, actually hitting Conor McGregor at the end. So you still have this kind of idea of pissing contest, you know, drama on screen, uh, aggressivity that is very much being promoted. All of this means that many authors since the 80s, as you can see, have actually theorize fighting games as an acceptable form of gay foreplay for straight people. And surprisingly, sorry, there's a bit of a long history of fighting contact sports and queerness, but I think it was kind of necessary. Um, this kind of leads us to the fact that many, many um, queer subcultures or just queer groups have reappropriated contact sports in many different ways. And I, I don't see since like Greek antiques, but probably, uh, let's start with uh, Beefcake magazine or uh, Physic Pictorials, you can see on the right, um, bottom right, which were magazines from the 1950s, started in the 1950s, often trying to bypass censorship and wrestling was very, very much a recurring theme. It's also, these magazines also saw a lot of Tom of Finland artworks, for instance, so they were very popular, uh, again, as, um, as gay erotica. But then with the internet, with the actually emergence of squash matches in pro wrestling and the emergence of porn in the 90s, a lot of things started to happen on the internet. Uh, Yahoo social groups started, I think, then Global Fight and Meat Fighters, which you can see in the center. It's actually a social website that I use, so I'm, I'm a bit more familiar with it. And it's very much, I don't know, we can think about a queer fight club in some ways. Uh, people are interested in, uh, have the very various and diverse interests, whether it's just having a bit of a rumble on the sheets, you know, or actually meeting outside for, a, for an actual bare knuckle fight. There is actually quite a lot of things going on in there. Um, but it's, again, it's more like the social media aspect of it. And then finally, Naked Combat, which you can see on the left, which is basically plain porn with um, a bit of a longer foreplay. Uh, you've got two actors fighting each other each other's. There is often a naked round and um, the winner dominates the loser. Naked combat very much um, reenacts uh, the hierarchy of gender norms um, in the squash match, which really can be traced back to Greek or Roman antiquity. And because I've just dropped that bomb, I'm just going to give you a bit of theory about this so that you don't like come lashing out at me uh, afterwards. So yes, directly associating the outcome of the fight with sex echoes the rigid and engendered, I quote, social hierarchy in which the penetrating phallus function as the primary signifier of cultural privilege and power in Greek or Roman antiquity. Back then, each sexual contact was said to signify and reinforce the male hierarchy in the mode of domination and submission, requiring, requiring activeness for the penetrating phallus passivity for the penetrated. So antiques representing men fighting and wrestling can, for instance, be read as metaphors and illustrations, of course, of such a hierarchy. And I think that we can find this in Grimm as well. If you think about the third, the second video I show you with Bass technically taking Rig over and over again, throwing him in the air, pinning him to the ground, and so on and so forth, you do have this kind of 
potential dynamic starting between the potential penetrator and the potential penetrated. And yet it doesn't happen. As you've seen, nothing happens. There is actually none of this. So this is where I actually kind of end, is that I do think that Kakuryana being potentially an erotic fetish and subgenre is actually really disappointing. It's, uh, it really lacks a sexual climax as well. What you've seen is what you get really for five, eight, sometimes 10 minutes. There's no gradation in the fight. There's no climax. The KO has nothing to do with any, I don't know, construct, you know, or any kind of canonical traits of gay porn and erotica. There is no real or visible um, libidinality in this kind of Gyakuryona grim fight that I've just shown you. And here, I think it's interesting to see that um, while pixels of the but you know of the fighters' bodies actually kind of interpenetrate in a sometimes disturbing way. I think we can think of uh, Zivinska's misappearance of sex. Uh, Zivinska argue that sex in games is by default uh, disappointing. It is often absent, and if you think of Mass Effect sex scene, which are basically just a fade out or Dragon Age as well, um, or The Witcher or the coffee mod in Grand Theft Auto, or Kratos having sex with Aphrodite, all of these are kind of funny moments, or they will serve a purpose. It will be a transaction at best. Basically, sex has nothing, sex in games has nothing to do with whatever form of sex you can have in real life. However, Ksevinska argues that, especially through aesthetics, games tease please the player in various ways, I mean, aesthetics and gameplay. And she takes the example of uh, Altair in Assassin's Creed 1, but it applies to all of the Assassin's Creed, except the most recent ones, which are a bit less into assassinations. Uh, but basically, Zivian Scout reads Altair as this feline, kind of beautiful, flowy uh, character, which is ours to behold. Um, you know, jumping on walls, jumping you know, on roofs, um, evolving in kind of antique environments, and then killing with a penetrating blade, blade uh, his victims. And um, each time you kill a victim in Assassin's Creed, one, you had a bit of a cutscene, which you can see in the top right here, which is kind of like last words, you know? And then um, Altair would actually probably, I can't remember, it was a, side of a, a saying, would recite a saying from the, from the creed and actually close the eye of his victim. So a highly erotic moment in many ways. So according to Zewinska, this is the kind of moment we actually have to look at if we want to think about sex in games. And I think that again, we can argue that Grimm's uncanniness also applies um, to this and kind of reveal its erotic consent. So, Grimm's game mechanic can be read as sex because muscular characters fuel the player's imagination following a powerful and erotic choreography and using their bodies coming into contact to serve a sadomasochistic sadomasochistic fetish. Similar to Altair, the control character or the opponent is literally and figuratively, figuratively ours to hold. With, with its absence of literal sexual content, Grimm moves away from acceptable game sex it is not wrapped in the silk of romance, an activity motivator, nor praise a conventionally satisfying ending. A few words now uh, in terms of concluding thoughts is that there are many, many other subgenre that are related to Riona. So first, uh, we could thought it wouldn't be Gyakuriona if it's just stages women, but I do think there is quite a lot of things to write actually about the same videos with women characters only, although it has different implications, especially because of the remaining prevalence of, don't want to say it, but the male gaze, you know, and even just lesbian erotica. You could also think about Greek. I mean, what about non-human characters, especially when I've shown you in Mugen? And uh, this leads to actually another point uh, just after this slide. We can also think about the affective labor of queer modding. Um, it does take time to create these videos. A lot of the videos and channels have been shut down because some admins could not list cope uh, or, or had some personal things happening to them and actually just like abandon the channels. There is something to say when it comes to the fragility of the platform as well. 
uh, if we want to talk about the actual realization of these videos, what does it mean to actually play online with the admin and record that video? When it comes to paths and uh, future kind of orientation to explore, probably improving this uh, reflection first and kind of like uh, trying to, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, fill the gaps. But one of them is absolutely uh, furry, uh, furry wrestling. I don't want to say furry subculture because it's too big, but I have had, I've encountered so many fan artworks and even independent mangas uh, online this last two months, just trying to prep uh, for the slides for this talk. And I feel that weirdly enough, this idea of having the dominant, the squash match, that aesthetic of the squash match in a fictional setting is extremely prevalent in the furry subculture. There are countless Twitter accounts of, of course, uh, people who identify as furries or who, have, who have actually identify as a character who are being drawn in various situations depending on their preferences or how they want to be showcased. And I definitely think that it's quite a lot to look at here. I was also so happy to encounter that manga on the right because it does also prove that, yes, this is also a thing in Japan. It's not just a Japanese word that we took and that's it. It is a thing. It's just like my knowledge of Japanese is very weak and um, I cannot reuse really my keyboard and search in Japanese, but that could potentially be something to look at as well. How does it actually operate in a potentially local context because technically it comes from Japan. And uh, finally, what happens when uh, it's about real people on Meet Fighters? As I've just told you, I'm actually a bit familiar with the website. I'm not super active as a member, but I know a few people. I know that the squash match is definitely something that people do. Uh, these are public pictures, by the way, so I'm not like putting profiles pictures uh, you know, on a, <laughs> on a recorded video. But I do believe that there is something to look at as well. And one of my friends <laughs> asked me to keep a diary of my potential encounters and maybe one day I'll think about this and uh, think about how masculinity also actually operates there. I can tell you there are quite a lot of different manifestations of masculinity uh, on meat factors. That's all. I hope you're not too exhausted. Uh, I definitely am uh, and uh, thank you so much for having listened to this Slightly chaotic chapter, but as I said, I still see it as a work in progress, despite the fact that it's actually published. Uh, I've cut down the references because I didn't use them all, uh, but here's a list of uh, some of the references if you want to have a look at it. And uh, yes, I'll welcome any questions. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Gaspar. Uh, loads to potentially talk about there. Content moderation, modding, shame and failure skilled and unskilled play but of various kinds um i think i th don't see any questions yet in the chat so i am gonna take the opportunity to to grasp the host privilege and um one of the dimensions of failure that you talked about that particularly struck me was that um with these youtube accounts they they sort of fail to live up to the promise of um social media and of web 2.0 that in that the idea is that anyone can make a thriving account and find a community and converse and um so but but of course the experience of most people is that they they don't get a million subscribers and get to monetize their videos and that only a very small proportion of people succeed on social platforms and that's the way they're built so that interested me that it, it's both sort of a failure and in some ways probably the norm in being marginal um which made me think about the way these things are studied i think a lot of digital culture studies talks about virality and spreadable content talks about entrepreneurial innovation talks about vernacular creativity um but maybe doesn't talk about the the failures as much so i guess i'm asking did you find work that was useful in helping you to do that do you think we need more attention to the things that don't become massive viral hits what, what do we learn by looking to these sorts of communities and these sorts of failures of communication so yeah so i, I yeah I, I haven't found that much actually uh work about this but also i mean you're pointing out something that was pointed out when the chapter was being proofread is one of my friends just told me, told me but 
but that's the queer internet Gaspar. Isn't it just like queerness on the internet? I'm like, it's not, and I'm like, yes, okay, that's true. I guess a lot of queerness on the internet is gonna be effervescent and fragile. In the real world it is, so why wouldn't it be on the internet? However, I do think that the fact that this, I don't want, I call it a server, but I'm not sure really, uh, actually, that's paragraph by the way, but, um, but it's, um, the fact is the centrality of this is YouTube and nothing else, I think makes it even more fragile than, for instance, a forum thread that might be the future, but is actually likely to stay and at least display oh, my connection is unstable uh, for some reason, but yeah, is more likely to um, to actually display the discussion that actually happened. What well, I find that with Yakuriona, it's very difficult to actually unearth what's behind. And um, yeah, as, I, as I've said, honestly, I've tried to contact, I've really tried to contact people. And I think the only way, and I didn't do it because I guess I'm too honest, I should have lied and buy Tekken Tech Tournament 2, which I actually have, uh, and just pretend I'm really into it and maybe meet and do videos and maybe reach the admin. But I just thought that it would have been too sneaky um, to do. Um, but yes, you're right though. Um, I do think that, uh, I think we should probably pay a bit less attention to, less attention to virality sometimes and pay a bit more attention on normality, which is, non-virality, non-virality, or whatever yeah, you call it on the internet, and actually look at these pockets and how they actually intersect, because I think there's a lot more to just a non-viral video, um, especially when it's still 30,000 views, you know, like, so. <laughs> um, uh, that's, I haven't really answered your question, sorry. Like, no, that's, that's <laughs> And I, I think it also maybe speaks to a methodological tension. I, I say this as someone coming from literary studies where you find the, the most obscure sonnet you can by an author who no one knows even existed, and that's good. And moving into digital culture studies where if it's not selfie taking or a, a hashtag that everyone engages with, there's a question of, well, how objectively important is this? Um, but I think you've made a very strong case for, for the value of kind of looking at these marginal kind of micro cultures and as you say not just marginal but ephemeral um partly due to seemingly people's lives partly due to content moderation we have a couple of questions coming from paul and from jack um so paul asks you suggested your work uh, deals mainly with watching rather than playing these games have you looked at the act of those playing these games and making these videos for others to watch um is there a kind of playful exhibitionism involved i know you also said that in in some cases they're sort of just recording normal gameplay and others they've kind of hacked or manipulated the camera through modding or um made their own kind of sprites and characters so yeah maybe some reflection on that you, you were mostly talking about what it's like to to watch and to try and read these as texts. What about the making of them? So the making, so I, I've looked a little bit at the act in the sense that um, there were interestingly a few technical questions here and there sometimes in the comments. It's like, oh, how have you done this? How have you done, you know, how have you, uh, can you tell me how you're doing this? Mostly recording, um, recording a basic uh, grim video as uh, the first one that I've showed you just required, uh, I don't even know if it required, yeah, it required a PS Plus membership, I think, to play online. And then it was kind of, re it was recording from uh, the, the admin playing his PS4, and then it was uploaded uh, on their PC. When it comes to actually having mods, I'm pretty sure this is a little bit more on the illegal uh, way, and then it's people using emulators, and then mods or dissecting a game, basically, and uh, adding, uh, adding them, so having, I think you a normal fight, recording their fight, and then just editing. Um, it is a little bit obscure in the sense that I am personally terrible with computing, and details are quite light about the making of this. It's very much something I wanted to know, but again, unfortunately, uh, neither Defeated Man, who I was very interested, Defeated Man, yeah, which I was very interested in because it was the most cinematic of, of the three. So there was probably the most work put into it. Um, I was really interested by their videos and I really wanted to contact them. 
but I didn't get any answer. I tried on Patreon, I tried on YouTube, I tried on Twitter, and I didn't get, I even tried on Fur Affinity, I think, because some of them actually have a furry uh, account. Uh, I didn't manage to get uh, any answer from any of them. Um, I think there is definitely something to say about exhibitionism, yes, because the, um, literally the, the summary of the profile of Gakuryana Mail is, I like, I like being, I'm a gay man, I like being grabbed and thrown by another character in a fighting game. So it's very, it was very much that description, very clear. Um, and um, there was a wish to recall videos and show them. So I do think there is definitely a, a bit of a sh want to share this. Whether it's exhibitionism, I'm not that sure. But I, I, I think it's safe to go that way a little bit, yeah. And we had a couple of questions from Jack. Uh, one saying, are there some tensions between the hypermasculinity of the avatars and queerness? Um, is the hypermasculinity necessary? Are there grim videos for games like Super Smash Brothers, for example, where you have much more kind of cartoonish, cute characters rather than these kind of hulking male wrestling types? And Jack also asks, do these erotics expand outwards from wrestling and grim? So you were talking specifically about fighting games, um, but Jack says, I'm thinking about games defined by the character being brutalized and beaten. And you, you briefly mentioned Dark Souls, a, a game... Um, where players are expected to fail repeatedly and to learn to love it. Is it is this something that expands past fighting games into those kinds of genres or not? So question two, I have a very clear answer. Question one, I do think there is tension. I think to be honest, the, the main, the main um, controversial as nature of my thesis is that, yes, we're just seeing hyper honk uh, guys beating up each other. Um, and yet I do think it's actually quite queer because of the way it's done. And we can actually think of um, Robert Siang, uh, Hard Lads, when it comes to that, I find, you know, the set in, uh, in the British backyard and it's like two British backyard, in, in a backyard in England, really, like bricks we can recognize quite stereotypical. And you have like lads like beating each other up with a chair and then I think kissing at the end. And I do think there's a bit of a link here. Um, are there grim videos for games? Uh, there are definitely Riona videos with cute characters. There's definitely an abuse of cute characters, but in general, I think there are women for what I've seen. Yes, I guess they are. So yes, but no, because they're still going to be hyper-masculine, but there are uh, grim videos of 2D games, which are a lot more cartoonish. And let's say that the dimension is a bit different then. The, the effects and the aesthetics and the feeling is definitely different. Um, however, it's very much, it is rarely the smaller guy dominating the bigger guy, which is so stereotypical, you know, in some ways as like, as narrative. Question two, yes. Um, so I mostly look at the fighting games um, because I do think that there's, again, slightly different implications. There are Resident Evil videos, about characters being killed. It is mostly uh, w yeah, and rest wrestling video games, of course, which I didn't mention, but very popular. Um, there are Yakuza has some elements, I think, that any any game that kind of involves the beating of a character can be used. Uh, there is uh, Metal Gear Solid Revengeance with Raiden being like literally destroyed by the final boss over and over. It's really violent, actually. I thought the video was really violent. Um, so yeah, there are the characters being brutalized. I'm, I'm sure if you type Gyakuryona Dark Soul, you will find one. Uh, actually, it's not the most popular, I think, platform, but it definitely can happen, especially because it technically doesn't have to be, if it's not grim, but just Gyakuryona, doesn't have to be a masculine presenting oppressor, it can be a dragon, so yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. I, I, I can't remember whose observation it um, is about um, failure in games that it's often made a kind of spectacular or even comical or kind of grunguinal spectacle in Resident Evil or Halo or ragdoll effects, fountains of blood, everything. But to see it over and over again is, is something different, I suppose. Um, really a question from Rachel, who I think is also having to leave, so maybe won't get to hear your answer. Um, but mentions uh, Denise Riley uh, and her writing on shame as it relates to exhibitionism, 
which I think is a point that's also been made about um, social media that often exhibitionism can stem from shame or can be a way of managing shame. And it, it seems, I mean, maybe this also speaks to the fact that um, part of the promise of social media is you proudly affirm your interests and passions and kinks to an audience of like-minded individuals, but the, the kind of sense of shame or failure seems to attach to the community itself here. They seem to be um, somewhat unwilling to, well, to answer your emails, to show their faces, to, to affirm that this is what they're into. But I guess a question maybe on whether there's any writing on um, shame and exhibitionism beyond game studies that you found um helpful yeah yeah yeah. and also just queer shame by sally Mott, for instance uh kind of drawing actually goes back into this a little bit and um and also i mean a big obvious one that i actually did forgot to mention because i did also in the chapter i don't expand upon it too much because I, it's um but it's that idea of uh it's the it's cedric of course um homoeroticism uh when it comes to contact sports and and how uh some mostly men really gather around the beating up of a character and then you know go back to uh you know would identify as straight and then uh, go back to their kind of like heterosexual relationship afterwards uh, because there are some watchers that are definitely a little bit confused about what's happening and yet they still watch so i find it quite interesting but again I think it's another it's another kind of worms really that we're opening there. Um, there's definitely something related about shame, um, vessel, uh, the the recognition of uh, the opponent as uh, the worthy opponents, and then uh, the practice of sexuality in real life. Um, um, uh, yeah, Chloe German. Yeah, I think I think absence of climax queer strategy. Um, or legend, maybe not climax, but at least mainstream climax, if that makes sense, probably, I think. Um, and yeah, I think feminist pornography is quite a good example. I'm not a huge specialist, but I do remember watching quite a few and going to a few talks, but it's super interesting. Um, I don't know what she, I think it was just come actually, She Comes, uh, C-M-E-S. Uh, I, I don't think I'm wrong, which was like a short movie, short uh, feminist, uh, queer pornographic movies and one of them was actually wrestling one of them had two women wrestling on beds and having fun and that was it that was five minutes of this it was a little bit less linear than a Giacriona video though so it was a lot sexier um, but I find that it does I would see the absence of climax as a potential queer strategy maybe not de facto but can be reclaimed quite quite easily especially in comparison to today practice of sexuality you know what I mean just when I, you know, as soon as, I don't know, <laughs> I don't want to talk about my personal experience here, but sometimes I'm like, oh Lord, uh, why is this so, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know if it was uh, an answer, I'm going to mumbling now. So. I, I had one question about realism and I guess for a long time, fighting games were sort of the cutting edge of um, graphical realism in video games because you only had to render two human bodies and you didn't need to sort of draw anything else so that uh, limbs and fingers and sweat and eye movements, those kinds of fine details were the pioneered there. But as your as the videos showed, they, they don't really bear too much close looking at, especially when characters are grabbing or contorting one another, the anatomy breaks down quite quickly. So is that something that you think adds to or takes away from the kind of pleasure people are taking in this? Is, it, is this something people talk about? Do they talk about realism or about these impossible anatomical contortions or not? So funnily enough, uh, I think the lack of realism makes it definitely queerer, for sure. For me, that's what I, I love this kind of like becomes a bit weird when it, that kind of uncanny valley like that we're probably doomed to have for a few years again, I think, in the, in video games. I love anything uncanny valley like really, and it's probably why I got really uh, interested in this. Uh, yes, actually, in addition to the fact that the kind of like sweaty bodies are very, very much commented on, uh, the idea of like, oh my God, I love the way the body is shown and so on and so forth. Again, quite recently, and I didn't include it in this video, it was a boxing grip video, and it was very much a gut-punching kind of video. 
and the comments were very yeah were about I love how the, how realistic the gut punching is I love how uh, how realistic this is uh, it looks like an actual uh, boxing massacre <laughs> you know so, so I do think it depends for whom and how people I do think it does play a role but then again Mugen Riona is so popular which is the 2D you know and so unrealistic I think the narrative if we can call it uh, the dynamic between the bodies is probably the primary interest but there might be some interest. Some people might just like the Tekken video. Some people might just like the Mugen videos. And again, there's probably another audience research to do here. Okay, no, it, it's, um, as you say, I, I think it's a chapter that pulls in lots of different directions, but I think it's all the richer for that. Um, and I, I can't see any more questions for the moment. Um, so maybe we, we can stop grilling you unless anyone would like to leap in with the last question. Um, and yeah, thanks for such a fantastic talk, Gaspar, for, for showing us these, these videos and for sort of drawing out all kinds of ways that I think this, this work and some of the questions you've raised could be extended. Um, thanks to, to everyone for coming along. So that is, I believe, our last event for 2022, um, shockingly. Um, we have some events coming up in late January. So on, on uh, January the 18th, um, on Wednesday afternoon, we have uh, Dr. Stefan Verning of the Utrecht Center for Games Research, um, who will be talking about uh, sustainable game, uh, open brackets, re close brackets cre uh, creation, I think uh, modding and sustainability in eco games. And I'll be joining him to talk about, in fact, recycling of video game assets and avatars. So some uh, mention of Mugen potentially there as well as a tool for sort of reusing bits of commercial games. Uh, and on January the 25th, um, we are having a playtest of Poppycock, a cutthroat card game of Regency era matchmaking that Joe McLeod Iredale will be leading. Um, so both of those I think should be quite fun. Um, I know a lot of you will already be um, aware of the blog, but Chloe has just posted the um, events page there. Um, cool. And I, this is news to me, but in, in February, we have an event on deep time in video games, um, which also sounds really interesting. So yeah, do please uh, come along to those, keep in touch. Um, thanks again, everyone for coming along and for asking questions. Uh, but thanks most of all to, to Gaspar. Thanks again for um, sharing your research with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and, and, and see some of you in Manchester. I will come up from time to time. <laughs> Thank you.